Isn't it weird how the last time I did a Christian video, like, this was the same shirt I was wearing? I guess it's not that surprising. I've got like 12 shirts I'm cycling through. Laundry day today, so that's, that's cool. guys, welcome back to another video. Today I'm going to be touching up on something that I talked about a little bit briefly at the end of my Chosen review. Look, I can't put words in Bobby's mouth and it would be pretty nonsensical of me to apply the death of the author principle to this just so I could hate on the movie. Yeah, it's another big term that I didn't have time to throw in like an explanation for. Between mise-en-sen and the death of the author principle, you guys are going to have a lot of like pretentious film terms you can throw around and make it sound like you're professional critics. I take one semester of film appreciation and suddenly I'm like this art philosopher. But anyway, what is The Death of the Author? The Death of the Author is an essay written in 1967 by French philosopher slash literary critic Roland Barthes. Essentially, what the essay was writing about was the idea of reviewing films, not from the perspective of looking at the author and what they brought to it from the outside, but looking purely at the art form itself and drawing conclusions about its message and about all that other stuff from the movie itself. And occasionally that meant taking away interpretations from art pieces that the original author did not intend. For example, someone can look at something like say, Moby Dick, and they can say this is clearly a story that is about man versus nature. It's showing how we as human beings are destroying the environment in our pursuit of greed. The author probably meant it as an allegory for man trying to pursue God or something to that effect. I haven't read Moby Dick, but I've heard it summarized at, in that way, so I'll, I'll take their word for it. Or for another example, you can look at the way that I look at Mumford and Sons. When I look at the art purely by itself in a vacuum, I see a lot of spiritual allegory, I see a lot of biblical allusions, I see a lot of spiritual tones to it, and yet, anytime I bring that up, someone who is a more secular fan of Mumford & Sons will say, no, that's clearly about a girl, that's clearly about romance, and this is an allusion to this. I don't know what the band's view on that is, because I haven't read any of their, any of the stories behind any of the songs aside from Dust Bowl Dance, but I strongly believe that the song I Will Wait works better as a song song about someone finally submitting to a higher power than it does for someone on the road trying to communicate with a girlfriend. There's lyrics in the song that just match up better with the man and the god relationship than it does with, you know, all this other stuff. But as long as I can back up that argument with facts that tie in directly to the song, I can say, no, look at this, this clearly has to mean this. As long as I'm making a case for it, by rule of death of the author, I can have that interpretation of it, while someone else can say, no, clearly this is referring to this. Another big example is that there have been conspiracy theorists who have looked into Stanley Kubrick's The Shining and looked for clues that Stanley Kubrick was trying to tell the world that the moon landing was faked. I know, it's a long, complicated string of events. I don't buy the theory at all, but by rule of the death of the author, they can back it up, they have logical reasoning for it, or not, it's not really logical, but they have reasoning for it, they can point out bits and pieces in the movie that say that points to that, that points to that, and so this fits in with all that. There are times where you have to draw a line in the sand and say, no, that's not just death of the author, that's completely ignoring the work itself. For example, I remember going online and looking up, like, the backstory for, uh, shoot, was, was it Diddy Money? I, I can't remember the guy's name. The guy who did Coming Home. I'm gonna put his name up on the screen and feel stupid later. I was looking at the backstory for that. It was this big long story about how his friend got shot and he was looking for redemption and just dealing with the grief and all that stuff. But even to apply the death of the author theory to that, I can look at that song and say, well, this is clearly about someone regretting not being a father and regretting not being there for their family and wanting to come back and just reinvent themselves. If you clearly look at the song and pay attention to the lyrics and just the general tone of everything, clearly that is a way to look at it. There was someone on this interpretation website that said, and I'm paraphrasing here because I don't have the exact quote pulled up, this song is about the devil and how he's trying to reclaim his throne up, up in heaven. But that won't happen. No! Jesus is coming. That is an abuse of the death of the author theory because that is not looking directly at something in the song and putting lyrics in context 
and talking about all of it. You literally just took a couple words out of the chorus and were like, I'm going to use that to like shoehorn in my worldview on this because for whatever reason I want this song to mean this. When I look at a Mumford and Sons song and I think, man, this really does have some spiritual themes to it, I look at it as a whole. I don't think their entire album is in that sort of way. I do think that there are some songs that are purely secular. The Wolf, uh, pretty much everything on the new album and all that. So yeah, that is the death of the author theory. But hey, that's just a theory. An art theory. Yeah, I know. What does this have to do with Christian films? Well, I'm getting right into that, my friends. So the thing about death of the author is that when you make something that is purely fictional and subjective, like film, you have to be willing to be misunderstood. In Stanley Kubrick's next film, immediately after The Shining, he didn't put up a disclaimer that said, oh, by the way, the moon landing was totally real. First off, because that would be super suspicious. But second of all, who cares about the slim minority that are going to apply their own worldview to your movie? But where do Christian films come into this? Well, we're going to get right into that. See, I think the death of the author theory is what terrifies so many Christian filmmakers, even if they haven't really heard about this before. For all the secular viewers out there, I don't know if you know this, but there's this weird idea within the Christian community that when you make a movie, you have to also be preaching a little bit, and that's why you guys don't really like seeing those movies, because they're not just because you might disagree with our worldview, but because, yeah, they're bad movies, because they're not movies, they're not stories. Basically making dramatized seminars. I've made a couple short films for my youth group that were meant to go along with messages, and I've had some preachy scenes in there, but in my defense, I have tried to put in some interesting characters in the storyline and like all that other stuff. We tried to work around it there. But the thing about theatrically released films versus what I made for Lake Tahoe or what Hume Lake makes every year is that these aren't connected to sermons. A Christian film, in theory, should be its own entity. You're free to tell a story. You don't, you're not restricted to a sermon. People like to think that they're smart when they go into movies. That's why so many people love Inception, because it's not the hardest to follow movie ever, but it's just challenging enough to where you're like, okay, Okay, I'm following this. I'm smart. If there's an opportunity for people to branch away from what's being directly said, look at subtext and look at mise-en-scene and look at stuff going on in the background and reinterpret things and look at things from other perspectives, people are more intrigued by these movies and people will come back to them and keep watching them and keep really exploring these movies again. Part of an aspect of The Grey that I love so much is that I can clearly very obviously see where there's a Christian spiritual aspect to it. Meanwhile, someone can also go into the exact same movie and say, no, you're an idiot. This is clearly where this is like humanistic and this is talking about man should be in charge of their own destiny. And we both have valid points to it. And so it's a conversation starter. To all the Christian filmmakers out there, I'm not God, so I can't tell you what your specific calling is. But from what I've seen, a film like The Grey can potentially be, we need more art that can start conversations and can open people up to the idea of, okay, maybe there's something more to this Christian thing than I thought before. Entertain and challenge people, but as I've seen through The Grey, and as I've seen through Mumford and & Sons, and as I've seen through so many other great works of art, if you're not willing to be misunderstood, then you can't really reach people. Do you want to preach to the choir over and over and over again and get a paycheck and check in and check out or do you want to tell a great story that can be used as a conversation piece that can be a launching point for these types of discussions and is just a good story that people will come back to and revisit over the years how many people were looking to interpret the this hidden messages of fireproof nobody's dissecting these hidden meanings there's not a film theory episode on do you believe because you're throwing everything at the audience and you're not letting them discover stuff and misunderstand things. That is the key to making an intriguing piece of art. It's something that has layers to it. But just in conclusion, if we are going to get good Christian films, we need to get a grip on the death of the author theory. Put aside the fear that people might not understand you. Put aside the fear that, oh, but if we do this, then how will we know they get this message? There are subtle ways to do it. 
if you challenge your audience, they will come back. Shoot, I've seen the gray like, what, like 12 times? I've gotten something new out of it every single time. And to my secular subscribers out there, just, uh, I, I hope you guys got some enjoyment out of this episode. Nice, nice cool little film term, some cool film theory going on. But anyway, that does it for this informative episode slash rant. <laughs> Got another episode of Why Don't You Love coming out a little bit later. It's about a movie that I am almost positive none of you have heard of. So that should be exciting. So keep your eyes out for that. Until the next video, God bless and stay saucy. The death of the ostrich. Jeez, oh, I can't. The death of the ostrich. Yep. Talking about you killed the ostrich. You did that. The Christian film industry killed the ostriches. Probably not gonna use this footage.